Good afternoon. The Labor Industry Veterans Military Affairs Finance and Policy Committee will come to order. I would like to announce that this meeting will take place in accordance with House Rules 10.01. This meeting may be viewed on House Public Information TV, which is available on the website. As is the custom with this committee, committee please rise to the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag, to the flag of the United States of America. Of America. And to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mr. Petrie, please take the roll. Chair Eklund. Present. Chair Eklund, present. Representative Zhang. Representative Detmer. Present. Representative Detmer, present. Representative McDonald. Representative Berg. Present. Representative Berg, present. Representative Bliss. Present. Representative Bliss, present. Representative Edelson. Present. Representative Edelson, present. Representative Frederick. Present. Representative Frederick, present. Representative Greenman. Present. Representative Greenman, present. Representative Nelson. Present. Representative Nelson, present. Representative Poston. Present. Representative Poston, present. Representative Raleigh. Raleigh, present. Representative Raleigh, present. Representative Sundin. Sundin, present. Representative Sundin, present. And Mr. Chair, we do have a quorum. Quorum is present. Thank you, Mr. Petrie. Next on the agenda is approval of minutes from March 22nd, 2022. Representative Detmer, did you look at the minutes? Yes, Mr. Chair, and I, I approve. I pass. I approve. Representative Detmer moves the minutes from March 22nd, 2022. Any questions, deletions, or corrections? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those say nay. Minutes are adopted. Members, we have six bills on the agenda today. Uh, so we're gonna have to we're ha gonna have to move quickly. Most of these are gonna be laid over. Uh, so let's be concise with our questions. Uh, first bill is from Representative Hansen, House File 4314. I move to refer House File 4314 to the Judiciary, Finance, and Civil Law Committee. Welcome, Representative Hansen. Please introduce your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Uh, the first time I was uh, in this committee with a bill like this was in 2007, and that was the Packing House Workers Bill of Rights. Uh, and that there was a provision passed uh, uh, at that time, and then it was uh, we had a legislative audit on packing house workers bill of rights and there have been various efforts to update the packing house workers bill of rights uh, over the years um, here we are again and this is a department of labor and industry uh, agency bill house file 4314 and the reason for this is that the challenges with workers rights remain and what this bill does is is the result of a task force that was set up uh, during COVID times to try to make sure that there was strong protection from workers and that uh, thus we have this packing house workers bill of rights. Um, I do have folks from the Department of Labor Industry to walk through it. Uh, you will see that it uh, adds uh, the poultry processing industry along with the meat packing industry, uh, provides for information uh, with an employee's uh, language uh, if it is not English. It increases some of the civil actions uh, that are available for damages. Uh, and then it also uh, provides a number of notifications and forms while it's increasing some of the penalties. Um, so with that, I would turn it over to the Department of Labor and Industry. Thank you, Chair Hansen. Uh, we have Jessica Groves, and if I got your name wrong, wrong Ms. Groves, I apologize. Director of Labor Standards and Apprenticeship, Department of Labor and Industry. Please identify yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Uh, Mr. Chair and members of the committee, my name is Jessica Gross and I am the Director of Labor Standards and Apprenticeship uh, Division at the Minnesota Department of Labor and Industry. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of House File 4314. The legislation before the committee today is also included in the Department Supplemental Budget Omnibus Bill, House File 4177, which the committee heard in prior hearings. This legislation reflects one of the recommendations made by the Agricultural Worker Wellness Committee to the governor on December 1st, 2021. The committee was established via Executive Order 2114 uh, and is comprised of local and regional representatives, 
worker representatives, community representatives, state agency representatives, including individuals from the Department of Agriculture, Department of Labor and Industry, and Department of Health, and the Department of uh, Employment and Economic Development, as well as employer representatives from the Minnesota Farm Bureau, Minnesota Farmers Union, and Minnesota Agrogrowth, Agrogrowth Council. The committee is supported by state agency representatives, and I am part of the state agency support staff team to the committee. Recommendations to the governor were discussed and developed over approximately 17 meetings between April and November of 2021, and the recommendation related to this legislation was approved unanimously by the committee members who were present for the November 22nd, 2021 meeting. House file 4314 updates and expands three worker protection laws that currently exist in Minnesota. One of these laws, the migrant labor law was enacted in 1981 and its most recent update was in 2005. Many of its provisions have never been updated. A second law, the recruitment and food processing employment law was enacted in 1995 and has never been updated. And similarly, the third law, the Packing House Workers Bill of Rights has never been updated and was enacted in 2007. Uh, this legislation updates these laws by adjusting for inflation, the potential penalties, damages, or fines for violations of these laws. And it also provides clarity regarding how these laws relate to other employment related responsibilities under Minnesota law. This legislation also does the following. In relation to the migrant labor law, it expands the scope of workers covered under the law to include all recruited migrant agricultural workers. It requires that the written employment statement provided at recruitment be provided in the worker's preferred language. It expands the scope of the information provided in the written employment statement to include information regarding an employer's workers' compensation insurance. It requires that employers maintain the written employment statements for a period of three years and it provides DLI with enforcement authority so that it can issue compliance orders and penalties for violations of this law. In relation to the recruitment and food processing employment law, it expands the scope of food processing workers covered under the law to include those who relocate from within Minnesota to perform food processing employment work. And it requires that the written disclosure uh, provided at recruitment be provided in a worker's preferred language. In relation to the Packing House Workers Bill of Rights, it expands the scope of workers covered under the law to include those who perform poultry processing work. It requires that the explanation to workers be provided both in writing and in person. It requires that the explanation be provided to workers at the start of employment. It expands the scope of the information required in the explanation to include information regarding an employee's, an employer's workers' compensation insurance and the right to workers' compensation insurance coverage. And it provides for a private right of action as well as authority for DLI to take action to address violations of the law. The proposed amendments and additions to these three current worker protection laws in Minnesota would help a greater number of agricultural and food processing workers to be fully informed of the terms and conditions of their employment. And it would also help employers of these workers to be better informed regarding how their responsibilities under these three laws relate to other responsibilities they have as employers under Minnesota law. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee for your time and consideration of this legislation. Thank you, Ms. Gross. Uh, Chair Hansen, did you have any other test fires or is this, this it for? Um, I think there is a letter in your packet uh, that yep. was supposed to be from uh, the United Food and Commercial Workers supporting the bill. Yeah, we do have that as well. All right, member questions to the bill. Uh, Representative Raleigh. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, to uh, the testifier, um, so there's a couple of different questions that I've got on this one. Um, the testifier stated that the information had to be uh, provided in the preferred language. What is the determination that uh, is used in order for the employer to know what the preferred language is of the employee prior to employment because it has to be provided uh, at the start of employment. So obviously it needs to be done prior to. Ms. Gross. 
Um, so the requirement regarding providing at the start of employment is part of the uh, Packing House Workers Bill of Rights. And that, that law currently says that um, it must be provided in the native language. The two other laws um, where there are the amendments that would require that it be provided in the, pref the workers preferred language, um, those, those disclosures or statements are, are provided at recruitment. Um, and so basically it would be a determination of um, what language the what language the worker understands so that they are able to know their terms and conditions of employment prior to um, traveling to Minnesota to perform work. Representative Raleigh. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And my question was, how does the employer know what the preferred language is of the recruited employee? Mr. Chair. Ms. Gross. Um, I, uh, I would imagine it would be by, by inquiring with the worker what their preferred language is. Representative Raleigh. And Mr. Chair, if the preferred language is not something that is available at the time that the offer is going to be made to the uh, potential employee, um, what, do you, what do you suggest that the employer does? Let's say it's a language that they've not encountered before, like Karan or Somali or a different language outside of English or Spanish. Ms. Gross. Um, so in terms of the, um, in terms of at least the food processing and employment law, um, uh, there currently is a requirement that DLI provide a standard disclosure form. Um, and so there is additional um, language that is added to this legislation to say that an employer could request that the department work to provide that standard disclosure uh, form in, in a different language beyond the languages it's currently available in, which are English and Spanish. Representative Raleigh. Um, okay, um, I, don't, I don't know where that's at in this bill. Um, I'll look to find that. Um, the second question that I've got is, and I'm not gonna go through each one of the sections, so I'm just gonna pick one of the sections. It states that whenever the court finds that an employer has violated the record keeping requirements of section 181.88, there's a $50 fine and that's being increased to $200. Uh, are you familiar with that? Uh, and so, I'm sorry, I won't, I won't do it that way. I'm sure you're familiar with the $50 fine that's being increased to $200. For a violation of the record keeping requirements of section 181.88, how much has the how much has been um, awarded in fifty dollar increments since this has been implemented, or any of the records that DLI has, Mr. Chair? That's gross. So um, the migrant labor law, which starts at 181.85 and includes 181.88, um, currently uh, DLI does not have enforcement authority over it. Um, so we cannot issue compliance orders or seek penalties. So we haven't previously sought penalties under 181.88. Representative Raleigh. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And would the uh, would the answer change if I went through each one of the other sections, like uh, dot eighty six, eighty seven, and and so forth? And, and I'm I'm not trying to trap you on this. I'm just asking. I want to ask the next question, but I need to figure out: Has there been these penalties of fifty dollars, two hundred and fifty, five hundred, and have they been um, collected in the past? Ms. Gross. Uh, DLI has not collected these penalties in the past because we don't have the authority to do so. Um, if they have been collected in the past, it would be through um, a civil action, which is um, the available uh, avenue for, for remedy at this time. Representative Raleigh. And so, Mr. Chair, what I, what I wonder is why, if we've not collected any of these uh, penalties up until now, why are we going from $50 to $200, from $250 to $800, and then from $500 to $1,600? And in some cases, the language says um, $1,600 or, I'm sorry, $1,400 or three times the actual damages for an employee injured. And, and what I'm wondering, Mr. Chair, is if we've not collected these before, why are we increasing these, sometimes tripling, almost uh, in other cases, doubling them? 
And, and I just worry that we're sending a signal to employers that, you know, we've not been able to give them tax relief on the unemployment insurance. We've, we've not been able to um, help them in many other areas. And I just worry that these bills keep piling on penalties and, and fines and fees to our employers. And it, it just doesn't feel like we're creating an environment that's going to be business friendly here in Minnesota. And I, I just worry that if we've not collected these in the past, why are we doubling, tripling, or quadrupling them? I'm, ju I'm just wondering if the testifier would address that, Mr. Chair. Thank That's you. Gross. Um, because the three laws that issue in this legislation were enacted quite a while ago, um, each of the fines, penalties, or damages in each of the three laws were adjusted for inflation um, to reflect what the actual dollars would be in, in today's dollars. Um, but the department would certainly be open to discussing um, concerns with these amounts and um, possible um, possible solutions for concerns. Representative Raleigh. Yeah, last question, Mr. Chair. Um, as, as we're looking at this, um, I've, I've just got to go back to where it is. Um, No, nope, I've, I've lost, I, I think it was encapsulated in that. Um, shoot, uh, I may come back to it, Mr. Chair, but thank you, I'm, I'm satisfied at this point. Okay, we're gonna move along quickly, Representative McDonald. Thank you, Mr. Chair, did you say quickly? As quickly as possible, Rep Representative McDonald, otherwise we'll be here Friday. All right, I'm always quick. Uh, uh, question for the author, Representative Hansen. Uh, Representative Hansen, um, it's always good, I believe, and we all believe, to uh, protect the employees and, of course, to protect the employers, the job providers. Uh, it appears, though, with the raise in your fees, doubling and tripling, uh, certainly it could be, uh, it, it would be bad for business and certainly bad for the consumer because at the end we pay for it. Question is, don't we already have through deed and Dolly legislation and state statutes that protects the employee? from some of the um, mistakes or egregious errors or uh, you know, mistreatment, if you will, of um, some of the things that are in your bill, aren't they already state law? Representative Hansen, Chair Hansen. Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Representative McDonald. You know, um, as the author of the Packing House Bill of Rights, that was in law and as the Department of Labor Industry staff mentioned, uh, it didn't have the teeth where they could enforce it because it was a result of compromise back in 2007. I think as we've gone through uh, the COVID crisis in the last few years, there isn't anyone who could disagree the devastating consequences on workers in both the poultry and the meatpacking sector. I think the evidence, is, the evidence is that the death rate was very high. And what these bills were intended to do was to provide communication. And to provide communication, there needs to be a consequence if you don't provide the communication. Uh, a few weeks ago, uh, 122 members of the Minnesota House voted for an increase in penalties on snowmobile trespassing. That was an increase in inflation because, again, laws that had not been updated with the times needed to be. The same thing is true here. Uh, Representative McDonald, I, my graduation was in 1981. That's when that started. That's a long time ago. The world has changed completely. The world has changed since 2007. We've just been through a pandemic. So I think House File 4314 is the least we can do to ensure communication in a native language. I'm hoping that we can get language for uh, the Ukrainians who will be coming here as a result of the conflict that is going on on the other side of the world. Representative be welcoming, we need to make sure that there's protection for those workers. I'd ask for your support. Sorry, Chair Hansen, I cut you off twice there. <laughs> Representative McDonald. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Chair Hansen, in your language of the bill uh, and or in your communication with uh, DLI, uh, do you find any reasoning for a 
the uh, term to err is human. So if a employer does not ask or provide the information in that native language, perhaps there's a language barrier in it of itself. Uh, is there any room for discretion of DLI or DALI or DEED if they have the authority to, um, to give a dispensation, if you will, for a first time mistake? Chair Hanson. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair and Representative McDonald. You know, having worked in state government uh, prior to coming here, uh, the agencies always have discretion. They could do a written reprimand, they can do a warning. Uh, and often, I think uh, even, even the teethless, uh, toothless uh, dollars that we have here, there may be written recommend, reprimands that are available. I want to be clear that uh, uh, the Department of Labor Industry may want to reduce the penalties or is open to that. As the author of the bill, I am not. I think this is, again, the most we could do, the least we could do in terms of providing protection for the employer to update these fines so they are commiserate with the risk. Discretion being the better part of valor, discretion can have a cost if someone doesn't do the correct communication and that discretion could have been deadly as the, as the pandemic that we just went through. So I think Representative McDonald, Dolly can and probably will have written reprimands, et cetera. But I think that increased penalties are needed for those who don't follow, because that risk of the for the employee is now great. Representative McDonald. Lastly, uh, Mr. Chair, because you want to be quickly, Representative Hanson, I recognize the need for uh, some of the fines when um, when uh, an employer may be deliberately um, at fault, but I think your the fines increase and your the payment from five days to three days when an employee leaves is, is egregious, it's overzealous, and it puts to the impetus uh, or the onus on an employer. He almost treats them as though a criminal, and it doesn't give any benefit of the doubt, any room for mistake, any wiggle room. It's just at the discretion of DLI or the other agencies, and I don't think that's good governance. So I think uh, uh, you're set on your bill fine. Uh, I think we'll offer an amendment on our side to at least put some safety nets, some safeguards in for the employers, the job providers, uh, to make room for mistake, to err is human. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Any other member questions? You guys have heard my rant several times. This is a job, that take, take, this is a committee that takes care of labor. We have other committees take care of business and UI and all that kind of stuff. But I might add, we did forgive a lot of business loans, PPP loans last year. So we do take care of our businesses in the state. Final comments, Chair Hansen. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Meat packing and poultry processing is a very dangerous job. It is risky. There are consequences for mistakes. What this bill does is provides for better communication. And if that better communication doesn't happen, there's a consequence to it. It's the least we can do. Something, it's not, I believe it's not onerous. I actually believe it updates things to the modern era in 2022, rather than 2007 or way back in 1981. I'd ask for your support to help out the workers and the employers by ensuring good communication and making our state better. Thank you, Chair Hanson. I renew my motion that House File 4314 be referred to Judiciary, Finance, and Civil Law Committee. Mr. Petrie, please take the call. Chair Eklund. Yes. Chair Eklund, yes. Representative Zhang. Yes. Representative Zhang, yes. Representative Detmer. No. Representative Detmer, no. Representative McDonald. No. Representative McDonald, no. Representative Berg. Yes. Representative Berg, yes. Representative Bliss. No. Representative Bliss, no. Representative Edelson. Aye. Representative Edelson, aye. Representative Frederick. Aye. Representative Frederick, aye. Representative Greenman. Aye. Representative Greenman, aye. Representative Nelson. Aye. Representative Nelson, aye. Representative Poston. No. Representative Poston, no. Representative Raleigh. Raleigh, no. Representative Raleigh, no. Representative Sundin. Aye. Representative Sundin, aye. And Mr. Chair, we have eight ayes and five nays. Eight eyes and five nays. House file 4314 is on its way to judiciary. Next up, thank you, Chair Hansen.
Next up, we have House File 4344 from Representative Hewitt. I move to refer House File 4344 to the Environment and Natural Resources Finance and Policy, Com Policy Committee. Representative Hewitt, please introduce your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, committee members. It's great to be back in this uh, such a great committee here at the House. Um, this bill is a very simple, straightforward. Rosemont is looking at expanding their public services. The city's grown quite a bit, uh, as you've seen in the last census, and uh, they need a new police station. So they're looking at doing a land swap with our military. Uh, I have with me today Mr. Don Kern, and he's going to explain more about the details of this for us. Mr. Kerr, Executive Director of Minnesota Department of Mili Military Affairs, welcome back to the committee. Please Thank you, Mr. Chair, and members. Proceed. For the record, I will say to you, even though you just said it, I am Don Kerr, the Executive Director of Minnesota Department of Military Affairs. So uh, this, this is actually an agency requested bill, Mr. Chair, and, and uh, I'm a little surprised it's going to natural resources because the authority we're using to actually swap the land is in Minnesota Statute 193, which is a military affairs bill. But nonetheless, that's not a big problem. We'll go ahead and take it that way. What we did discover is we were working with the city of Rosemont with our attorneys. The city came to us several years ago and asked to do this land swap with us. Uh, and uh, we were looking at it very hard. It, it actually is using a parcel of land that's next to an existing facility. When we originally bought the land, we bought apparently more than we needed. And so it is actually excess to our needs. And the city asked us if we, it, originally it was out on the edge of town. And um, now, of course, town has grown up around, so now we're in the center of a large residential development. And so it's a wonderful place for a police station, and not so much a great place for further military development. And so we went back to the city and said, hey, if you can find us equal acreage, we would swap the land with you. That way we're taking care of the people of Minnesota by protecting the investment that we made there. And uh, it took the city some time, but they found some land for us. The reason we're here with this bill is because the dollar value of the acre for acre swap is not equivalent. And under the Minnesota statute and the DNR side that governs that, we wanted to clarify that we acknowledge that the dollar value is different. Uh, we also identified that constitutionally to do a land exchange, the uh, exchange has to be approved by the land exchange board, which meets quarterly. And we felt that this legislation did a couple of things. It clarified uh, that we have legislative authority to do this swap, which we believe is in the best interest of both parties and clarified that we were not responsible, excuse me, sir, to uh, to meet that uh, requirement of, uh, of dollar for dollar value. And so we do feel that the land is actually more value to us. The land that they're proposing to swap is uh, has got a secure boundary around the Coke refinery and very close to Highway 52. So it's less desirable from a residential perspective but much more desirable from our perspective for a potential future need. Uh, again, this supports the city of Rosemont and uh, we, we feel very strongly it's the right thing to do to be a good partner with them. And we feel they will be a good neighbor next door to us at our field maintenance shop in Rosemont. And uh, we'll then have the land available out near the refinery for some future development should we decide we need to. Uh, that's pretty much it, Mr. Chair. So if you have any questions. Thank you, Mr. Kerr. And, and the reason it's going to environment is just that they, they need, they, they're, we're checking to find out if it needs to be part of the lands bill or not. So we may be changing what happens with it once it gets to the environment committee, but it's just uh, staff is looking into it. Representative Detmer. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and just a quick question. I'm assuming that the governor, the attorney general and the state auditor is on board here because they have to approve it too. Am I correct, uh, Mr. Kerr? Mr. Kerr. Mr. Chair, Representative Detmer, so they are the land board, the land exchange board. And uh, we, our determination was to go through the legislative process prior to getting calendared. Their next hearing is in May, which is one reason we'd like the thing to move on its own uh, to try to get us on their calendar with this action already accomplished by the legislature. Uh, so they, the governor's office is aware of it. Uh, we have not informed the other members of the land exchange board because, well, that's what we do when we take it to the land exchange board, Mr. Chair. <laughs> Representative Detmer. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and, and uh, Mr. Kerr. Um, is this going to be a standalone bill is it, or is it going to be put in an omnibus bill, Mr. Mr. Chair? Um, I'm thinking this, if, if it doesn't become part of the lands bill, Representative Detmer, it'll, be, it'll probably be standalone. That's why we have okay. staff checking into whether, whether it needs to be part of that or not. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chair. Chair. Uh, Representative Hewitt. Yeah, it is. Uh, the Senate's run it through as a standalone, is my understanding right now. Okay. Thank you, Representative Hewitt. And we're just uh, 
as they say, crossing our T's and dotting our I's to make sure it's done right. Any other member questions? All right, uh, final words, Representative Hewitt. Thank you very much, committee, for uh, helping us through this uh, uh, land bill that's really important to the city of Rosemount. Thank you, Representative Hewitt. I renew my motion that House File 4344 be referred to the Environment, Natural Resources, Finance, and Policy Committee. Mr. Petrie, please take the roll. Chair Eklund. Yes. Chair Eklund, yes. Representative Zhang. Yes. Representative Zhang, yes. Representative Detmer. Yes. Representative Detmer, yes. Representative McDonald. Yes. Representative McDonald, yes. Representative Berg. Yes. Representative Berg, yes. Representative Bliss. Yes. Representative Bliss, yes. Representative Edelson. Yes. Representative Edelson, yes. Representative Frederick. Aye. Representative Frederick, aye. Representative Greenman. Aye. Representative Greenman, aye. Representative Nelson. Aye. Representative Nelson, aye. Representative Poston. Yes. Representative Poston, yes. Representative Raleigh. Raleigh, aye. Representative Raleigh, aye. Representative Sundin. Sundin, aye. Representative Sundin, aye. Mr. Chair, we have 13 ayes and zero nays. 13 ayes and zero nays. That doesn't happen often in this committee. Good bipartisan bill. Representative Hewitt, you're on your way to environment. Okay, next up we have House File 4333 from Vice Chair John. Vice Chair John, please move and introduce your bill. Uh, Vice uh, Chair Eklund and uh, committee members, I would like to move uh, House File 4333. And uh, this this bill is a veteran service uh, office grant program. Uh, uh, Vice Chair John, we, oh, have, yeah. we have to move move to lay it over. Uh, well, sorry, I would like That's to okay. move uh, House File forty three thirty three uh, to be laid over for possible inclusion of, in a future omnibus bill. And uh, the bill I have uh, before you here is a veteran service grant bill. Uh, providing grants for uh, county veterans uh, service offices um, and some other additional provisions in here. Um, the Minnesota Co County Veteran Service Officers uh, were formally authorized uh, by the Minnesota Legislature in uh, 1945. The bill allowed each county to appoint uh, a veteran to serve as a CVSO and provide support and assistance in securing benefits for servicemen and women uh, that were soon to be returning to Minnesota. Uh, and then eventually in 1978, uh, the legislature uh, made the employment of a CVSO mandatory for all 87 counties uh, here in Minnesota. Um, and then um, there have been increases over the years, uh, but funding for this program uh, hasn't changed from the current uh, appropriation of uh, $1.1 million since 2013. Uh, the grant to the individual counties are based on the uh, county veteran population and may be used for uh, the following purposes of uh, outreach to county veterans, assistance in reintegration of combat veterans into society, uh, co collaboration with other social services agencies, educational institutions, and other community organizations for the purposes of enhancing uh, services offered to our veterans. Um, and another component is to reduce ho uh, homelessness among veterans and to enhance the operations of the county uh, veteran service offices. And uh, these current uh, these grants. They currently range uh, from $27,500 uh, for Hennepin County, uh, the most populous county, uh, to $7,500, which is provided to 32 counties uh, with populations of less than 1,000 veterans. Uh, the bill would increase the annual appropriation by $450,000, bringing the total value to uh, $1,550,000 for the existing CVSO grant program um, under uh, Minister Statute uh, 197.608. Uh, the 1.450,000 uh, 1, to the individual counties for their uh, CVSO office, and then a $100,000 grant 
uh, to uh, uh, MACVSO used for uh, administrative costs of the association certification of uh, mandated uh, county veteran service officer training uh, and accredit accreditation. Uh, along with the costs associated with uh, reintegration services. Uh, the bill would also amend the CVSO uh, grant program to provide additional grants to individual counties on a competitive basis, not tied to veteran population. Um, and additional grants would be available to any county that proposes uh, to provide programs and services that the Commissioner of Veterans Affairs, along with uh, consultation uh, with, uh, the, uh, with MAC uh, VSO as dictated by the current statute existing, um, and determines to be new and innovative in uh, serving veterans in their communities. And uh, with that, uh, I would like to open up for any questions. And Thank you, Vice Chair Zhang. And we, have new, uh, we do have Greg Peterson, Legislative Director, Minnesota Association of Company Veteran Services Officer here to testify. Mr. Peterson, please identify yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, my name is Greg Peterson. I'm the legislative director for the Minnesota Association of County Veteran Service Officers, a membership run organization of 150 veteran service officers employed in our 87 counties. I have been a county veteran service officer for 18 years and am the highest in, eighth highest in seniority. First, I'd like to thank the Minnesota legislature for creating the county veteran service officer program 77 years ago. We have evolved immensely since 1945 and have helped hundreds of thousands of veterans, dependents, and survivors. Today's CVSOs attend specialized training, receive a FBI vac background investigation with fingerprints, and we take an annual exam. We adhere to ethical standards, possess unique knowledge skills, and practice our talents beyond the personal moral obligations of an individual. We require a high degree of competency to help our customers navigate complex federal and state programs, and we extend unrivaled empathy to each that seeks our assistance. The CBSO grant program has been in existence since 1993 and uses the number of veterans in each county to determine funding distribution. The veteran population is reported annually by the National Center for Veterans Analysis and Statistics which bases its findings on estimates and projections and not actual living veterans. An unintended fallacy of this model is that the veteran population is not synonymous with our client caseload. The data is devoid of spouses, dependent children, widows, and the nearly 13,000 citizen soldiers in Minnesota. We count on grants to provide outreach, assistance in the reintegration of combat veterans, collaboration with other agencies to enhance our services and heed the governor's mandate to eliminate veteran homelessness. Since the last appropriation in 2013, more than one third of our counties have dropped off their population tier and lost critical funding. Three counties fell off the lowest level in this fiscal year, each losing $2,500. By slightly increasing the appropriation and allowing the commissioner to provide a competitive grant, our service officers will recoup lost funding and implement innovative programs that work in their unique situations. Finally, we favor increasing the appropriation to the Minnesota Association of County Veteran Service Officers, which we use for administrative costs, training, certifying our service officers, and reintegration services. We are the only state that sends a team of CVSOs to army bases where our deployed guardsmen are offboarded from military to civilian status. We meet with every soldier, interview for concerns, complete VA forms, and provide CVSO contact information before they return to Minnesota and hang up their uniforms. We are committed to fulfilling President Lincoln's 1865 promise to care for him who shall have borne the battle and for his widow and for his orphan. I thank you for receiving my testimony 
and stand ready for your questions. Thank you, Mr. Peterson. Uh, member questions, Representative Detmer. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and for the author. Uh, now the governor's supplement budget recommend, recommendations ask for additional $450,000 in 22-23 uh, uh, biennium, presumably in fiscal year 2023. Now I see that this bill appropriates, I think, uh, it appropriates additional $900,000 in the current biennium, 450,000 each year. You know, why, why are we having this increase in the current biennium where normally you would have the increase in the uh, upcoming biennium? Uh, Commissioner Herkey, can you answer that? Mr. Chair, it's Commissioner Larry Herkey, um, Minnesota Department of Veterans Affairs Commissioner. The 450,000 is for uh, 2023. Uh, for a por portion of the buy-in, we want to start this uh, ability to allow for this competitive uh, uh, offer to the county veteran service officers, and then, uh, as you as you did indicate, uh, 450,000 each year in the next buy-in in 24 and 25. Representative Detmer. Yeah, Mr. Chair and, and uh, uh, Commissioner Herkey, now are we also getting nine hundred thousand dollars in the current biennium? That was my that was my big question. I knew that we're getting the uh, in the next biennium, but it looks like we're getting appropriations and additional nine hundred thousand in the current biennium for fifty each year. Is that correct, Commissioner Herkey? Mr. Chair, if I can have uh, Brad, L Deputy Commissioner Lindsay, just make sure he's, I got the math right and explain it. He's on and, and can explain that, Mr. Chair. Commissioner Lindsay, thank you, Commissioner Herkey. Commissioner Lindsay. Good, uh, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chair, committee members. Uh, Brad Lindsay. Uh, Deputy Commissioner of Programs and Services for the Minnesota Department of Veterans Affairs. Uh, the intention, uh, I'm trying to take a look here at the actual bill. Uh, the intention was, as the commissioner said, that we would have the increase starting July 1st of this year. So this upcoming uh, fiscal year and then moving forward with the new amount going into the next, uh, the next biennium. Thank you, Commissioner. I guess that's why we call it a supplemental budget. Representative Detmer. Okay, so am I correct then that, that there's another $900,000 for this, this biennium? I see uh, uh, Ms. Roberts is there. And I see that too, Representative, McDon <laughs> uh, Representative Detmer. Ms. Roberts, can you please okay. uh, address this question? Um, yes, Mr. Chair, Representative Detmer, I, you are correct the way the bill is drafted. It has that additional funding in both years. The governor's budget materials um, that were released um, by Minnesota Management and Budget only have the increase in fiscal year 23. Okay. Okay. Thank you. That, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, uh, Mr. Mrs. Roberts. Uh, yeah, that was my big question. And. Uh, um, oh, normally, Demmer, you froze. I, I guess question. Normally, there you go. Representative Detmer, you froze. I, I, you froze up, Representative Detmer. We didn't hear your comment. Okay. Did you do that, Mr. Chair? No, I'm just kidding. I, I don't have that capability. My <laughs> kids tell me I'm not even smart enough to be on a computer. So, <laughs> well, anyway, what, what I was saying was that uh, normally when we pass legislation, it would be funding for the next, next biennium. And it uh, looks like we're funding the current biennium and the next biennium. That's what I. That's what I picked out of, in the language. So thank you, Representative. That was my that was my question. Thank you. Any other member questions? Final comments to your bill, Representative uh, Vice Chair Zhang. Uh, thank you, Chair and uh, Committee members. I think uh, we all want to support our veterans, and I think this is a good bill. Um, and uh, I'd like to thank the department for uh, working on this bill with me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair Zhang, and I can see why we're freezing up. I'll make my annual comment. This is why we need to be doing these things in person. But anyway, Vice Chair Zhang renews his motion that House File 4333 be laid over for possible inclusion. Uh, bill's laid over. Next up, we have House File 4335 from Representative Edelson. Representative Edelson, please move and introduce your bill. 
Oh, thank you, Chair. One second, I just lost my notes. <laughs> I apologize. Okay, um, Representative, or excuse me, um, Chair Eckland, I would like to move House File 4335 to be laid over for possible inclusion in the Labor and Veterans Omnibus. Thank you, Representative Allison. Please proceed with your testimony. Okay, thank you, everybody. And bear with me, I have a terrible cold and I'm struggling to breathe right now. <laughs> so, um, House File 35, or 4335. Um, uh, Okay, good. Uh, so since 1945, the Minnesota legislature has provided appropriations to congressionally char uh, chartered veteran service organizations in Minnesota to support their operations and enhance, and enhance the effectiveness of their service to Minnesota veterans. Currently, um, we, we have an appropriation from the general fund, the Minnesota Department of Veterans Affairs, uh, each year for grants to the following congressionally chartered veteran service organizations that support Minnesota veterans, um, disabled American veterans, military order of the Purple Heart, American Legion, veterans of foreign affairs, Vietnam veterans of America, and vets and paralyzed veterans of America. These veteran service organizations grant amounts that are calculated based on two factors, a set dollar amount per member of the organization and a dollar amount based on the percentage of the USDA claims. The 353,000 that's appropriated was first appropriated in the Minnesota session law of 2009, I'm sorry. And the amount that has not increased, that amount has not increased in 13 years, despite increasing cost of operations. For the fiscal year of 2022, grants provided for this funding ranged from 116,000 to American Legion and the largest veteran, which is the largest veteran service organization. And the smallest to AM Vets was 1,500. This, provi this bill provides a much needed increase to the grant amount annually made available to veteran service organizations from 353,000 uh, to 500. Thousand. Further, their appropriation would amend the and to amend, amend to remove the Vietnam Veterans of America from the appropriation language, as their state level organization disbanded in July of 2021 and closed their office. This bill also creates a new section of law and establishes the statutory language codifying codifying an existing criteria for the grant distributions to the organizations. As an existing program, MDVA will continue to manage these grants through its relationships with the veteran service organizations. The agency will be able to see how well they incorporate the increased funding through implementation of new grant programs, charitable giving, and increased veterans benefit claims with the USDVA. With that, Mr. Chair, I would like to move to my testifiers. Thank you, Representative Edelson. We have two testifiers and I remind them we're short on, we're a little short on time. So if we can make our comments brief, that would be uh, appropriate. First up, Mike Maxa, adjutant, I always get that word wrong, adjutant, American Legion, Department of Minnesota. Mr. Maxa, please identify yourself for the record and proceed. My name is Mike Maxa, the uh, adjutant for the American Legion. Department of Minnesota. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members for this opportunity. The American Legion is in full support of this as uh, it was stated that uh, we have not seen an increase since for 13 years. And we all know that the uh, cost of doing business and inflation has been going up over the years. And just this past year, we've approached an 8% inflationary. Um, we had to close our office up at the St. Cloud VA Health facility a number of years ago, about eight years plus, due to uh, we could no longer fund it and we would like to get that opened back up again to take care of those veterans in the St. Cloud area. Um, we also have the Minnesota Veterans Assistance Fund that the American Legion does um, promote. We just uh, kicked it off here officially the first of November. And for direct support, we have uh, paid out over $35,000 since the 1st of November. And what this uh, increase in monies could also do is help veterans with some direct support that are um, fall under the classification of veteran in the state of Minnesota. But what it doesn't do is take care of those veterans who are not classified as a veteran in the state of Minnesota. An example is you have reservists that have worn the uniform for 20 plus years, but they do not fulfill the 100 and 80 day requirement or deployment to a combat zone. And we can fill that void with this Minnesota Veterans Assistance Fund. So we feel that it is instrumental that 
we receive an increase in the grant so we can continue our mission and improve upon our mission. Thank you, sir. I didn't now take any questions. Thank you, Mr. Max, for your testimony. Next up is uh, Greg Peterson, Legislative Director, Minnesota Association of County Veteran Service Officer. Mr. Peterson, welcome back from your uh, short respite here. Please thank proceed you, with your Chair. testimony. Thank you, Chair. I again thank the legislature for the legislature for creating the CVSO program in 1945. Today, CVSOs and VSOs work together closely on claims for vet for federal benefits to ensure our veterans and their de dependents receive their rightful benefits. I want you to know that as a CVSO, I depend on each of our VSOs unique missions they perform in Minnesota. The American Legion's Veterans Affairs and Rehabilitation Committee led by Department Service Officer Jeremy Wolfsteller ensures that Minnesota veterans receive timely access to quality health care and benefits. CVSOs happen to make up three fifths of Jeremy's committee and they evaluate four regional medical centers to ensure our Minnesota veterans are being well cared for and top priority. The DAV of Minnesota Transportation Program provides free transportation to veterans in Minnesota to attend their VA medical appointments. The program has 34 vehicles stationed in 20 communities around the state. I have a DAV provided van, which has cut my $16,000 transportation budget in half. I've only mentioned two VSOs and a single program from each but all of our VSOs have dozens of programs to support the needs of Minnesotans who have borne the battle, their widow and their orphans. I encourage your passage of this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Peterson. Uh, any member questions? Seeing none, Representative Edelson, oh, Representative Detmer. Yeah, I, I need to bring up that we have the same situation in this bill as we had in the last bill that there's uh, um, money is, is being additional funds are also not only for the next biennium, but also in this biennium, which um, I don't recall this happening before. So I'm just uh, checking to see if uh, that is something that uh, came out of the governor's office or out of the uh, Department of Veterans Affairs or, you know, how did that happen? So. Uh, Commissioner Lindsay or Commissioner Herkey, can you comment on that? Mr. Chairman, this is Commissioner Herkey. The intent was to increase, starting in July, increase the amount from 353000 per year to 500000 um, just so we could get uh, additional monies out. This would allow, I think, on average, if Changes in membership remain about the same from year to year. This would provide about 16% more for those veteran service organizations. So it was our intent to start uh, as of July of this year. Rep. Sam Detmer. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. So uh, th that was the uh, department's uh, request, but it looks like uh, we are we are providing uh, funds during this biennium. If I'm if I'm correct looking at the language. So I just wanted to point that out to the chair. Thank you, Representative Detmer. Like I said earlier, that's why we do supplemental budgets. Yeah. Uh, any other member questions? Representative Edelson, final comments for the committee. I just ask members for your support. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Edelson renews her motion that House File 4335 be laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. The bill is laid over. Next up, we have House File 4334. Thank you, Representative Edelson. I hope your call gets better. Next up, we have House File 4334 from Representative Frederick. Representative Frederick, please move and introduce your bill. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I move that House File 4334 get uh, laid over for possible inclusion in the future omnibus. Thank you, Representative uh, Frederick, to the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. House File uh, 4334 uh, is uh, appropriating funding to take care of our uh, veteran cemeteries. Back in 2009, the Minnesota legislature approved uh, the construction of three different veteran cemeteries throughout the state, one in Redwood, one in Redwood County, one in St. Louis County, and another one in Fillmore County. Um, in partnership with the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs National Cemetery Administration, or the NCA, uh, the Minnesota Department of Veterans Affairs um, successfully secured funding and completion of uh, 
the construction of the cemeteries in Fillmore County in St. Louis County. Uh, in 2020, uh, the MDVA received funding uh, for the cemetery in Redwood Falls. Um, with that, uh, the construction with the construction completing, uh, the MDVA is looking to uh, get funding to be able to um, maintain them. Uh, and so this is would appropriate $830,000 $830, uh, to allow the MDA, MDVA uh, to take care of those. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Representative Frederick. Uh, we have uh, Ben Johnson from Legislative Director Legislative Director, Minnesota Department of Veterans Affairs. Mr. Johnson, welcome back to the committee. Please identify yourself for the record and proceed. Uh, thank you, Chair Eklund. Ben Johnson, Legislative Director for Minnesota Department of Veterans Affairs. Uh, I'd like to thank Representative Frederick for carrying this bill and I, I don't have much to add. I'm here simply to answer any questions related to the request for additional funding. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Thank you Mr. Johnson. Member questions? I'm seeing no member questions. Uh, um, Representative Frederick, final comments. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, committee members. It's a pretty simple bill. Uh, it's really not controversial. It's just that if we're, we're going to have uh, these veteran cemeteries, we just need to take care of them. So I appreciate the support. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Frederick. Representative Frederick renews his motion that House File 4334 be laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. Members, our final bill is House File 4468 from Representative Greenman. Representative Greenman, please move and introduce your bill. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I um, uh, want to move that House File uh, 4469 uh, be laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. And uh, I also understand there's an A22 author's amendment. Uh, Representative Greenman, would you like to move and explain your amendment? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I move the A22 amendment. Uh, what this amendment does is it adds an appropriation of $2 million in fiscal year 23 uh, for the Minnesota National Guard enlistment incentives. Uh, it's with the goal of attracting um, and training National Guard service members. In the last three years, the, the National Guard has seen an uptick in, on, um, in need and stepping up to support our communities and serve um, in nursing homes and communities and responding to unrest and federal service. And this is one additional tool to encourage the retention of our experienced uh, soldiers and airmen. Um, so I think uh, I'd ask that for member support in adopting this amendment before presenting the bill. Any questions to the amendments, uh, amendment, the A22 amendment members? Um, seeing none, all in favor of the A22 amendment, please say aye. 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 say nay. Motion, uh, the amendment is adopted. Uh, Representative Greenman, to your bill as amend, amended. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I know we are short on time. Um, so you just heard what the amendment does. Um, House file uh, 4468 as amended, both includes those enlistment incentives I just explained and um, appropriate $765,000 in fiscal year 2023 to implement and manage the holistic health and fitness program for the Minnesota Army National Guard. Um, we heard this presentation in committee a few weeks ago uh, when, uh, when Mr. Don Kerr presented the Department of Military Affairs Supplemental Budget. Uh, this is an Army program that focuses on strength as well as nutritional, spiritual, mental, um, and sleep readiness. Uh, the implementation of this program will enhance the readiness of the uh, Minnesota um, Army National Guard, um, and it will um, help uh, um, Guard members um, allow them to attain higher fitness, uh, recover from injuries, and serve uh, longer in the Guard. Uh, the Army has begun implementing this program with act active duty units, but has not yet covered the reserve components, and this investment will let our service members here in Minnesota um, allow the agency to implement the program before federal come. Uh, funding becomes available. Uh, I want to thank uh, Chair Eklund, Lee Detmer, Representatives Berg, Edelson, and Raleigh for co-authoring this bill. Um, and I know that we have uh, 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 Executive Director Don Kerr here as well. Thank you, Representative Greenman. Uh, Rep uh, Mr. Kerr, uh, please welcome back to the committee. Uh, please identify yourself again and proceed with your testimony on this bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, members, I am Don Kerr, the Executive Director of the Department of Military Affairs, and the author did a great job explaining the bill. I'll just touch a little bit on the amendment that adds uh, $2 million this year 
to our enlistment incentives appropriation. I think I discussed this a little bit when we talked about the supplement. We hadn't completed our needs assessment at the time, but uh, we did look at it and decided that we did want to request the $2 million. I appreciate uh, Representative Greenman for carrying the bill and uh, hope for the committee's support. Subject to any questions you may have, sir. Thank you, Mr. Kerr. Member questions? Representative Detmer. You're, you're, uh, you're muted, Representative Detmer. Another reason, why, another reason why we should be doing this in person. That's Representative right. Detmer, that's but, right. Uh, please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, it's a good bill. I, I, but I do want to suggest that in, in these bills, even though it's with our military affairs and our veterans affairs, there's need to be some wording and accountability and, a re, and re, reporting back to the legislature that provides these funds through our taxpayers. And, uh, you know, I, I know they put out a, I know the military affairs and veterans affairs, they do put out a, a yearly uh, summary, uh, but we need to have some feedback on accountability of these funds that are going out for our veterans and their families. So if somehow we can make that known and maybe through the process, Mr. Chair, have that in the languages as we go forward. Representative Detmer, I believe that with Mr. Debo watching, Ms. Roberts watching, Ms. James watching, that they will take note of that. And these bills, when they're laid over, they are a work in progress. So we'll see what we can do to address those concerns. Thank you. Yep. Anything else, Representative Detmer? I'm good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Representative Raleigh. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Appreciate it. And uh, to Mr. Kurt, um, is this request uh, in the uh, in the incremental increase? Is this due to the changes that we just approved for the eligibility for removing the prohibition on giving the signing bonuses uh, for the 12 year plus um, reenlistment bonuses, Mr. Chair? Yeah. Mr. Kerr. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Raleigh, not directly, sir. Though it's possible that we will implement a bonus for those personnel that are above 12, but. It it's not directly tied. So the enlistment incentives appropriation funds our state tuition reimbursement program, our MOS reclassification program, and our recruiting, uh, or excuse me, our uh, reenlistment bonus program. And what we're seeing right now is a reduction in funding from the federal side in many cases. It's very interesting how the feds are approaching this because they're really yeah. going with ginormous bonuses on one hand and then eliminating bonuses for other MOSs without a lot of regard to what the individual needs of the states are. And so by having the authority inside the state, uh, the adjutant general has the authority to kind of target bonuses as necessary to make sure that we're retaining the people that we need to retain. So there's not a direct correlation to that change, Representative Raleigh, but it's possible that we will start implementing that. Uh, the reality is right now, uh, there are very few people that, that are going to be, I believe it was about 320 people that by moving that extension from 12 years out to 20, that would become eligible for a bonus. That's not a big number in the Minnesota National Guard. And really we were asking for that authority for the out years as the blended retirement system comes more into effect that was implemented in 2018, I believe is when the NDA passed it, that mandated that. So we really were looking deep when we asked for that requirement. Uh, we might coincidentally open some of those bonuses if they're at the right target place, uh, but most of our bonus work is still down at the front end of this in the six to less than 12 years of service to try to convince people to stay in. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Raleigh, thank you. Yeah, Mr. Thank Chair. you, Mr. Chair. And, and what I'm hoping is some of these uh, MOS reclassifications will go to 11 Bravos. <laughs> thank, thank you, you Mr. Chair, I appreciate it. Thank you, Representative Raleigh. Any other uh, member questions or comments? Uh, Representative Greenman, final comments on your bill. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I just, um, uh, for folks who have not yet signed on, please sign on. Um, uh, I really appreciate this. Um, uh, when we think about recruitment, retention, and readiness, I think that this, uh, when we added the amendment, um, uh, the, the bill reflects all that. So I ask for your support in including it in the omnibus bill. Thanks. Thank you, Representative Greenman. Representative Greenman renews her motion. House file 4468 as amended be laid over for possible inclusion in a future omnibus bill. Uh, members, few things coming into next week. We will be, um, we'll, we'll be wrapping up, uh, getting our omnibus bill ready to go. We'll have a few more bills, both labor and, and veterans related next week. And then we'll be putting together our omnibus bills for the following week for uh, third deadline. So uh, we're well on our way. I don't know what the committee's uh, schedule or structure will be after, after that, but uh, we'll keep you informed. And 
I guess maybe I should crack the whip a little more often. We're done early today. I never thought we'd be. So any, any member questions going forward? With that, seeing nothing, we are adjourned. <laughs>